bonjour, guys, gals, and non-binary folk. I hope you're having a good day and welcome to Jer. I'd like to segue from this introduction by saying, I love video games. Throughout my entire childhood, I played absolute classics like Mirror's Edge, Bioshock, Dishonored, Deus Ex, Human Revolution, and so on. On an Intel Pentium N3700 1.6 GHz CPU with 8 GB of RAM. If you don't know what that means, <laughs> it means I was playing with straight trash. However, that didn't stop me from having a lot of fun. It's actually quite fascinating how someone can play these games far from the optimal state. Some may even say to the point where these games were unplayable and still have a really good time. Such a good time that inspired them to make an entire channel given their thoughts and analyses on video games. Sure, not a lot of the videos were good, but that's, that, that's not the point. Listen, the point is, let me rephrase. I analyzed quite a few of these games from head to toe because the art form is just that interesting to me. Yet, despite loving video games, so much to the point that I started analyzing them, there was a certain point when I realized I don't actually know what makes a video game fun. I know when I'm having fun, but in past projects, I've consistently failed to communicate effectively why I'm having fun. I didn't watch one GDC talk. I didn't look at the design philosophies that these game designers would explain. And even though fun is part of the title of this video, I don't even think fun is the right word. The word fun is rather vague, subjective, and even restrictive. Honestly, the reason why I used fun in the title is because it rolls off the tongue better. Also, for search optimization, not having this realization also explains why I made some of those pretty bad videos that are now either unlisted from my channel or were never uploaded to begin with. But when I had this realization, I decided to take some action. I started trying to understand those philosophies, watch those GDC talks in hell. I even started reading. Can you believe that? I started reading because of video games. All of that has led to this moment. So, settle in, bring in some food, maybe with a nice beverage. As for the next hour of your life, you'll be learning about what makes a video game fun. It's me, Mario! In order to understand why people like playing video games, we need to look at how products are generally designed for us. So, let's do a brief history lesson. Products nowadays are designed to be human-centric, which means being designed for human capabilities and limitations. This may seem obvious when I'm saying this out loud, but if we travel back to World War II, machines like warplanes were designed to have an engineering-centric design, in which people would be expected to adapt to the machine. This may not sound too bad. For example, if you're a trained pilot, surely you're still going to be able to work a plane. But this isn't the case. Unfortunately, some of us are imperfect creatures and have our limitations. So when we're put in situations that put us under pressure, such as um, war, pilots that were even highly trained would start making errors. Apparently, this was because the cockpit across aircraft models wasn't consistent. And this was due to the engineering-centric design. Henceforth, to fix this came the concept of human-centric design. When computers came along to people's homes in the 80s, the concept of human-computer interaction was proposed, which they itself laws and principles in order to make computerized interfaces as simple and as pleasurable to use as possible. Then later, a psychologist named Donald Norman proposed the term the user experience to account for the entire experience that a consumer has with the product including the marketing and the customer service. The user experience is mainly about adopting the perspective of the users and trying to design for a specific experience with that product. This design is then tested with user researchers who study the product with a sample of their target audience to see whether it's delivered the intended experience 
was again also being simple and pleasurable to use. These concepts are still being used or should be used in our current day and age from anything and everything you can think of, like cars, phones, tablets, websites, computers, and of course, video games. Woo, feeling good. One of the most important factors of a video game is, of course, the experience of it being used. Holden laid out a framework of what games should have in terms of usability with seven things. Science and feedback, clarity, form following function, consistency, minimum cognitive and physical workload, error prevention and recovery, and finally, flexibility and accessibility. That may be a lot to throw at some people, so let's break it down. Signs and feedback is simply making sure that the stimuli in the game can be perceived by the player. If I shoot an enemy, I should be able to see that they've, you know, registered that they have a bullet wound. Twice about coming in here. This would be usually supported by an animation of the enemy being staggered, blood and particle effects, sound effects of yelling, you know, all the things you'd expect if someone gets shot. This is very linked in with the concept of clarity which is defined as making sure that the signs and feedback are clearly perceived by the player. It may seem simple to clarify basic feedback and signals, but different players, depending on their levels of experience with the genre or gaming as a whole, still may not be able to pick up on them. If you're new to first-person shooters, you may not notice that in Doom 2016, you can pick up a shotgun in the first level. Whilst the shotgun is faintly glowing, that signal may not be clear enough for a new player to realize that they can interact with it, as they may not be literate with the language of video games. It's probably why in Doom Eternal they made weapons float and glow with a bright green, to further clarify to new players that this is a weapon they can interact with. It just stands out so much more from the normal environment that you can't really miss it. Other ways game designers may try to indicate how elements of their game function is through the concept of form following function, which is defined as when elements of a game can be intuitively understood. For example, if players jump off the void in Mario 64, they probably understand that they're going to die. No! No, 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 If a player looks at the spikes of Bowser in Mario games, they will probably assume that jumping on the spikes might hurt you. If form doesn't follow function, this could cause frustration with how a player interacts with the system, as it will directly conflict with the player's intuition on what they can and cannot do. An example of form not following function would be, and, and allow me to be petty, the mecha zombie from Doom Eternal. Since my shotgun is able to demolish zombies with one shot, you'd think that these enemies would have similar amounts of health, right? They both look equally as fragile, equally as broken inside. Nope, this enemy takes 2.5 times more damage than this enemy. Now put this in the context of a game when you're whizzing around an arena at top speeds, making split second decisions that affect whether you even survive. And this gets especially frustrating. And this could have been circumvented by making the mecha zombie more beefy, more buff, less fragile so I could have intuitively thought that they take more damage than this guy, therefore avoiding these frustrating experiences. However, side note, if you like first-person shooters in any capacity, I demand you get Doom Eternal, and you genuinely owe it to yourself. Go to your Steam store or your preferred gaming platform of choice. You, you better be doing this. I'm, I'm not even joking. Go to your Steam store, search up Doom Eternal, click the game, and put it on your wish list. I'm not going to tell you to buy the game right now because, you know, times are hard. You know, the economy is trapped. What's also important to mitigate unnecessary frustration and to not confuse the player is consistency, which means that science and feedback <laughs> are consistent. <laughs> Remember when we were talking about the cockpits? Well, apply that to video games. Imagine that sometimes you can open a specific type of door in a game and in other sections, Sometimes you can't open that specific type of door. Wouldn't you be confused on what kind of doors you could open? Well, that's due to a lack of consistency. Without that consistency, 
The player can be left confused on the specific elements of a game, which will be unintentionally frustrating. So when there's a game mechanic the game designers present, it's important that the mechanic is consistent to prevent this frustration. It's also paramount that when designing a video game, the game designers don't overwhelm the player with a bunch of unnecessary inputs and stimuli that they have to process. Because as um, humans, we are very limited in our memory and attention. So it's important that our cognitive and physical workload is minimized when it's appropriate. This is so the player can focus more easily on the tasks that are actually designed to challenge them, instead of spending their precious energy on things that aren't part of the game's main focus. Fortnite isn't designed around someone's cognitive ability for memorizing which button on the keyboard does what. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, 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 okay. Listen, that's stupid. <laughs> what I've just said is completely stupid. Games are designed around somebody's cognitive ability to do something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to play them. <laughs> um, I didn't realize how stupid that line sounded until I was editing it and until I was out of my accommodation. Which is why I am in different conditions. I am in a booth. And I'm really sorry that it sounds really different and it may be jarring to some of you. But <laughs> I, what do you expect me to do? I've moved out of the place. <laughs> um, sorry, let, 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 let me just do the line. Let me just, re let me just redo the section, actually. Fortnite, for example, isn't focused on trying to challenge someone about their cognitive ability for remembering controls. <laughs> so on the side, they display key bindings for those specific tasks to minimize that cognitive workload. Minimizing the cognitive and physical workload in this way allows the player to be more comfortable with the game's controls, but also focus on the elements of the game that are actually designed to challenge them, such as in this example, reflexes and hand-eye coordination. Now, before we move on, let me ask you a question. Have you accidentally spent an entire year worth of rent money on several items that you didn't want because of one accidental misclick? Probably not. If you have, you need to do one of three things. Number one, stop lying. Number two, see a therapist. We all know that wasn't an accident and you have an unhealthy spending habit. And number three, switch banks or stop lying. However, if you play video games regularly, in which there's a system in which there's an exchange of currency involved, you have probably experienced the slip up. This is called a lack of error prevention and recovery systems. If you make a mistake which is not part of the game's main focus, such as accidentally selling a weapon, a well-designed system of this kind probably has a recovery system for you to get it back via a refund or giving you a chance to say no to the question, are you sure you want to sell this item? This is a more simplified system of the purchases you make with real world money. There's usually a wall of things that you have to get through in order to make those real world purchases. This is because humans sometimes are indeed stupid and these recovery systems allow you to curb those stupid mistakes. But along with stupid people, Wowzers, it looks like a joke in very poor taste has been removed from this video. It's almost like the writer has somewhat matured and realized that just because a joke is edgy doesn't mean it's funny. Whoa! Hence, flexibility and accessibility options. Flexibility and accessibility helps players to customize various options within the game to suit their preferences and needs. This can range from button and key remapping of controls to subtitles, colorblind mode, etc. This makes the game more accessible to audiences without compromising the experience that the game is supposed to provide. These aren't exactly elements that I would say contribute directly to the fun of a video game, but more of make a video game a more accessible experience, hence indirectly contributing to how fun the game is to play. Without developers thinking of the user experience, these games would be less fun to play, because we'd be forced to adapt to systems that weren't designed for us, an engineering-centric design, which would make us more frustrated due to increasing our cognitive and physical workload in a way that wasn't intentionally part of the game's experience. And for this reason, we should be grateful that thinking of the user experience is not only part or should be part of making our video games, but our products in general. Okay, you've had your vegetables. Let's move on to the meat of the video. What factors make a video game fun? 
What makes a video game fun? Well, again, this question is misleading because the term fun is very vague and restrictive. Someone who may enjoy first-person shooters like Doom, which require fast reflexes and good hand-eye coordination, may not enjoy the stealth games like Dishonored, which rewards a playstyle that's slow and requires patience. I mean, <laughs> it... it that's a lie. It does depend on who you run into. Have you heard of Clockner? Clockner is like... <laughs> insane. Uh, the author of The Psychology of Video Games also makes the point that fun and immersion are due to other people's perception. So the term that we're going to focus on instead is engagement. Yes, yes, yeah, okay, okay. I know the word engagement is kind of a meme, right? <laughs> but I do believe it paints a better picture for the factors that we're going to explore. There are three core pillars for what people believe makes a video game engaging. Motivation, emotion, and game flow. Motivation is very difficult to define. However, for now, we'll define it as a process or mentality that allows us to accomplish our actions. <laughs> Hoden proposes two types of motivation that are important in relation to video games, extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is defined as performing an action for an external reward. And intrinsic motivation is defined as performing an action for the pleasure of doing the task. You could imagine how both of these could manifest through video games. Extrinsic motivation could manifest by trying to get a new item or combo in a game, leveling up your character, etc. Whilst intrinsic motivation is a little bit more complicated. In order to actually achieve intrinsic motivation in video games, game developers try to satisfy the self-determination theory, which is defined as trying to satisfy the player's need for competence, autonomy, and or relatedness. If you watched that game theory video a few years back, you get the gist of what I'm probably talking about. Competence is mainly about making the player have some sort of progression, whether it's through artificial ways like leveling up your character, or them just being more skilled in the game, whether it's through playing for a long time, and or spending time in training rooms to hone your skills. A lot of games have a combination of both artificial and actual competence, for lack of a better term. But for this example, I'll use uh, Payday 2. Why? <laughs> Why Payday 2? Because I love Payday 2. <laughs> Let's start with artificial competence. Payday 2 is a game where you complete tasks in various levels. And once you complete that level, your XP bar increases. Once your XP bar is full, you level up, which rewards you with skill points that you can use in your skill tree. These skill points can then be used to upgrade various aspects like speed, health, damage, deployables, and etc. And thus making you more artificially competent. However, how a player uses cover, adapts to different enemy types and levels, and uses their skills to their disposal is more in relation to their actual skill and understanding of the game instead of how artificially buffed or specialized their character is. The different types of competence serve as a way to feed the player's motivation, thus engaging the player. Autonomy is mainly about self-expression, which can range from things like cosmetics, taunts, and skins on your items. You can express yourself as being completely serious, stylish, a goofball, the possibilities are truly endless. But autonomy isn't just about cosmetics. It's also the different ways of how a player can approach a certain situation and whether it feels meaningful to them. Team Fortress 2 is a great example of a game that encourages autonomy. The game gives the player specialized classes and a huge rogues gallery of weapons that can be used to create specific loadouts, allowing for self-expression. For example, you can play as a default soldier who does reliable damage with his shotgun and rocket launcher. Or, if you really want to get spicy, 
If you simply just change your loadout, you can be a troll with a no damage rocket launcher that allows you to jump around the arena at rapid speeds and instantly kill people with a shovel, or as I would like to call it, the meme spoon. No, no, no! <laughs> you, you have to use that. Let's go, my boy! <laughs> if you change class and become the scout, you can be a fast, annoying brat who deals close range damage with a shotgun. Or, if you really want to justify the bullying and neglect you experienced in your childhood, you could equip the Sandman and stun your enemies for a brief period of time before killing them. Hey, let's go! <laughs> if you change your class to Demo Man, you can go from playing as a man shooting grenades and sticky bombs to playing as a man who can charge at people at supersonic speeds with a sword. All of these options are ways to allow the player to express themselves and approach situations differently, therefore fulfilling the autonomy aspect of the SDT theory. I didn't even finish the amount of ways you could play this game. I haven't even scratched the surface. There's nine classes and around 140 different types of weapons. Imagine the amount of loadouts you can possibly have, and imagine the amount of playstyles. Mm, okay, let me not be disingenuous. Not all of these loadouts and playstyles are going to be useful in all contexts. In fact, some of them are just going to be flat out bad. <laughs> however, however, if these bad loadouts still grant a sense of meaning to the player by providing a new engaging experience, it would still technically satisfy the player's need for autonomy as they're still able to approach the situation from how they see fit. There are players who do nothing but sit in a corner with nothing but a sandwich. If you don't call this self-expression, then I don't know what self-expression is. <laughs> Relatedness is quite simple. Relatedness is defined as having meaningful relationships with other people throughout the game, either through cooperation, competitiveness, or even both. Let's use a typical example that demonstrates both cooperation and competitiveness. In TF2 Casual, you have 12 players on a blue team and 12 players on a red team. There is a game mode called Push the Payload, in which the blue team is responsible for pushing a payload towards the end of the map, whilst the red team tries to stop that payload from being pushed. Of course, killing the opposing team players is a great way of stopping that opposing team from achieving their goal. But that's easier said than done. So cooperation with your team is extremely important as they'll be able to help you kill, keep you alive, or conjure up strategies to stop the opposing team from winning. A strategy that we used in this clip was called a quote-unquote double uber. Alright, let's keep them in spawn. <laughs> nah, that ain't fun. That ain't fun. Come on, let's... <laughs> <laughs> this strategy consists of the medic classes making one of the heavy classes invincible for that temporary period of time so the heavy class can put out insane amounts of damage without worrying about getting killed. Space pick, you go fast, yeah? Go, go, go. Oh, okay, we're going fast, okay. Okay, never mind. Do it. This is then followed by a second medic and another heavy class doing the same thing to extend that amount of time that we're able to damage the enemy team. Yes, it feels cheap, but <laughs> it gets the job done. Oh, they love it. Ah, uh, I feel so bad. That's awful. <laughs> That's awful. This shows how important relatedness is, as my teammates communicating with each other allowed us to hold back the opposing team for that temporary period of time, thus giving us an advantage at the start of the game. Those people being teammates is therefore a meaningful relationship. Additionally, trying to win against the opposing team also serves as a meaningful relationship. This is because not only does it serve as a motivator for me to work with my teammates, but it also helps me to achieve both intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. The intrinsic motivation being engaging with the game's mechanics.
and the extrinsic motivation being winning the game. Spy, spy. Yeah, baby. There we go, there we go. Hey, yo. Good game. Good game. As stated in the book, emotion is mainly about game feel, which refers to how good it feels to interact with the game. Dr. Holden didn't really delve that much into game feel within the book itself. So, I did some digging and found the article and book written by Steve Swink, which I will remind you are called Game Feel. Swink describes game feel as slippery. It's mostly characterized by a subconscious combination of sights, sounds, or instant responses to action. In the article, they mention Super Mario 64 quite frequently, talking about how good it feels to run, jump, spin, how addicting it is, due to game feel. They broke this concept down into six pieces. Input, response, context, rules, polish, and metaphor, which I won't go over because it's essentially the exact same thing as form following function. Let's say you're sitting down to play a first-person shooter. You enter a match, ready to get into the game. You lay your hand onto the mouse and you pull a 180-degree spin and you're not able to change the sensitivity. You're probably going to put that game down and I wouldn't really blame you. This leads us to the conversation about how a game responds to the input of your controller. Because if an awkward combination of controls are required to do a specific task, if the geometry of the controller is annoying and cumbersome, if the sensitivity is too high, the game isn't going to feel as fun to play. Therefore, it's important for game developers to contextualize the controller for their video game, otherwise known as the organ of expression. If that isn't the coolest way to describe a controller, I don't really know what is. Well, actually, Two of my friends responded saying it sounds like a sexual innuendo, but whatever. It sounds cool to me. Along with input, the writer also goes on to emphasize the importance of response, which he defines as how a system processes, modifies, and responds to player input. Now, this may seem simple and quite similar to science and feedback. You know, press the jump button and your character jumps. Press the run button and your character runs. And granted... Yes, I would also consider these factors of game feel, but Swink also talks about how the nuances of input may affect the responses within the game. Pressing the jump button for a long time may result in a high jump, but simply tapping the jump button may result in a short hop. It's little nuances in your input like this that could change the entire game feel, so to speak, which not only gives you more options with how to approach the game, but also makes the game feel better to play at least within a specific context. The reason why I bring up context, which is defined as how constraint gives spatial meaning to motion, is because without a well-designed environment, world or AI for which those mechanics can be put to the test, the game may feel shallow, no matter how deep your game mechanics are. In Mario 64, if the world is not contextualized to Mario's moveset, does the fact that he can long jump, slide, backflip, or triple jump even matter anymore? Most likely, no, because your moveset and tools aren't contextualized. There's no reason to use them. Therefore, your game feel would likely be lacking to some degree. Doom Eternal, for example, contextualizes its mechanics into its gameplay brilliantly. Let's focus on two mechanics, the dash, and the meat hook. The dash and the meat hook are used to dodge heavy amounts of projectiles and demons, close the distance quickly with enemies, and jump over large distances. These moves are extremely useful because they are being contextualized, therefore contributing to the game feel... feeling better. I, I, I wrote that. Rules are also an important factor when it comes to the feeling of a video game. And rules define as how arbitrary relationships between abstract variables in the game change the player's perceptions of game objects, define challenges, and modify sensations of control. 
that's a mouthful, Jesus. Swink once again refers to Super Mario 64 to expand upon this concept in his book. Quote unquote, why am I collecting these coins? If it didn't refill Mario's health or if 100 coins didn't give you a star, which allows you to progress to another level, thus accessing more content, would you bother? Well, most likely, <laughs> you just wouldn't because there would be no reason to. The fact that these abstract variables have a relationship with us that change the way we play is extremely useful in order to push players into interacting with the game system. Think of it as a carrot on a stick, or rather, the carrot of the star, as a Swink likes to say. Rules are important because it gives the players some extrinsic motivation to play the game, thus hopefully allowing them to experience a sort of intrinsic pleasure when interacting with the game's mechanics. In conjunction with these factors contributing to the game feel, we also have to talk about the level of polish a game has, which is defined as the interactive impression of physicality created by the harmony of animation, sound, and effects with input-driven motion. To demonstrate this example, Swink says that they want to make a game that's squishy. So they separate squishiness into components such as deforming motion, squelching sounds, moist slugs, etc. This will give the impression of a squelchy physicality due to the physical clues that get assembled together. Before we get into game flow, we need to define the flow state. The flow state is defined as one being deeply concentrated in an activity that's both worthwhile and challenging. The psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, rest in peace, he died in October 2021, found that people were happier when they were in the flow state more often. This can range from studying, playing sports, or video games. Now, in order to allow the player to more easily enter a state of flow, there are three things that a game designer should implement. That is, challenge, pacing, and onboarding. Now, a game needs to be challenging in order for the player to feel like they're overcoming certain obstacles. Otherwise, without this sort of challenge, the player will just get bored. Imagine playing Devil May Cry, but you don't have to dodge enemy attack patterns and enemy just stand there. You have all these really cool mechanics that can just be strung together. But what's the point of using those mechanics in your arsenal if there's no challenge? It just becomes a mindless activity of pressing square. What pushes you into the game mechanics and its systems is the fact that enemies are really aggressive. There are different enemies with varying attack patterns and the only way you can defeat them is using the plethora of moves in your disposal in a skillful manner. This example demonstrates that difficulty is an extremely important factor in one achieving game flow, thus creating an engaging gameplay experience. I got him! Yeah! However, some don't like the constant stress of enemies swarming you for the entire game. Some people need to breathe, to relax, to process the situation that just happened, or prepare for the other situations. Thus, Pacing is very important in games in order for players to achieve a state of game flow. Pacing within a game is defined as the rhythm between stress and relaxation. Devil May Cry has sections after you fight in which you just walk in a level. It kind of serves as a break or a reflection of the fight that you've just been part of. Now imagine if Devil May Cry had no breaks between its levels, no time to relax, no time to process the bosses at hand. You'd just be constantly stuck with this. I love these games, but <laughs> goddamn, I would be so constantly stressed out if there were no sections to just run around and explore the world. I don't think I would be able to play that game as much as I do. But this form of pacing isn't necessary for all games. Devil Daggers is a game that doesn't really give you a break. It's a wave-based shooter which consists of fighting against numerous enemies until the player dies. 
I guess the form of pacing in this game is the slow, consistent rise in difficulty as you survive through the waves of enemies. If the rise in difficulty wasn't consistent, the pacing would just be thrown off by a huge degree because the random difficulty spikes would be unpredictable and completely jarring. Plus, the game is in an 8 hour campaign it lasts as long as you want, so I guess having no real breaks is a lot more bearable. Of course, in order to actually beat a game, you first need to understand the foundations of its systems and rules, which is the third and final concept of what a player needs in order to achieve a state of game flow. Onboarding. There are a large variety of ways in which players can learn the ins and outs of a game's systems, whether it's through tutorials or just being forced to observe and adapt to a new system that's been introduced. The player further understanding the system that they are being presented is another way of making the player feel like they're progressing or becoming more competent, not only satisfying the aspects of intrinsic motivation, but also allowing the player to feel a sense of game flow. So to summarize, what makes a game engaging? Celia Holden mentions three core pillars of engagement, which are motivation, emotion, and game flow. These core pillars aim to satisfy our desires for self-expression, a need for competence, a craving for meaningful relationships between people, an appetite for challenge, and a want to experience an immersive world. Of course, these needs are going to vary from different types of individuals to entirely different types of cultures. Again, engaging in fun is an important distinction because fun seems like a more vague and restrictive way to describe a game and the pleasure derived from it, meaning that it's probably less applicable to the majority of people, whereas engaging seems like a more objective and broad way to describe a game, which is more likely to apply to the majority of players. Okay. <laughs> uh, did I clip? No, I didn't clip. Okay, cool. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> that was a lot to talk about. Let's summarize what we've talked about in this video. We've talked about how games are made for us by delving into the history of ergonomics of products and the creation of the user experience. We've also talked about the user experience for video games, such as science and feedback, clarity, form following function, consistency, minimum cognitive and physical workload, error prevention and recovery, flexibility and accessibility, and finally, what makes a video game engaging, which involves motivation, emotion, and game flow. These things will culminate into the quote-unquote fun factor of a video game and why there's such a massive love and culture around them. I find it really fascinating how much thought goes into the video games we play in order to make them more enjoyable experiences. Listening to people's personal anecdotal stories in gaming and thoughts about what they personally think makes a video game fun is really cool. But reading about how game developers and scientists study the data and create theories on the fun factor and learning about ergonomics of video games is another side of video game design and critiques that I think everyone interested in this genre should explore. Because not only does it further display and emphasize the thought, the effort, and the time that goes into the making of video games, but it also further gives us an insight on why video games are fun to play. If you weren't interested in hearing the more psychological approach of the fun of video games, I hope this video piqued your interest and maybe, potentially, inspired you to look into the more psychological approach yourself. Or, or hell, maybe got you into video games. Anyways, I'm done. 
I'm bad at writing conclusions. So I'm just going to do the closer. <laughs> All right. So um, that's the video done. Have my, and I have Susan with me. If you've seen previous videos of her complaining that, you know, kids on YouTube watch porn or something. So this is you, this is you, right? <coughs> you already know, bro. Yeah. yeah, but if you play the video game, you pretty much know about Half-Life already. But what if your audience doesn't know about Half-Life? Then how did they find a six subscribed YouTube channel? <laughs> <laughs> also, also, this booth is crumbling apart. Give me a sec. Yeah, I've been in here second. for a solid one minute. It's already breaking. <laughs> that is all it took. <laughs> the energy was vibrational. <laughs> it is breaking. Uh, <laughs> are we supposed to be talking about the video? Or what? Yeah, I don't I'm know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the video is great. It's taken way, way, way too long to come out. I've been waiting it's, for what feels it's like it's passable. Bro. It's not great. It's passable. I've that's, been that's... waiting for too long for it to not be great. <laughs> Let's be honest. You've you've seen, you you've been a test viewer. You can. It's not a great video. It's it's a passable video. That it's I've above loved. average for most YouTubers. So yeah, but that's not saying much. <laughs> a lot of YouTubers make really like sh content, and I tried to make something that was, I think something that was like, my intention for it was to be great originally. But I don't think it became great. I think it's I, I think it's clear that I learned a lot from it. Definitely worth watching, though. Worth watching. Definitely worth watching. I think it's okay. I think uh, it's something that I'm just like you know I can put this out and be okay that it's out there. You're your worst critic. I promise you. Honestly, <laughs> I believe that many people will enjoy it. And uh, comment down in the comment section below. If why you, you do, plug? Why are you plugging me? I do, like, I, <laughs> a like and share video for me. Yeah, <laughs> wink, wink. I know he won't say it, but I will. <laughs> I <fuck>? will. <laughs> I don't chill up my like that because i i could i got less. you i, I got no less. shame bro i'll <laughs> say it you don't need to oh good his video is worth it i beg you watch it so what can we expect next you know you're, your you're, next act, you're, you're acting like such a disingenuous interviewer <laughs> i am trying okay bro bro the, bro bro what is next the, to the, come? this 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 is the authentic part we're supposed to be authentic <laughs> My brother, what comes next? I beg you, <laughs> answer the question. Uh, I want to do better. I want to make some better stuff. Mm. Uh, this is definitely, I think it's a stepping stone in the right direction for better stuff. But uh, yeah, definitely expect some higher quality stuff in the future. Also some more unique stuff. I think after being there and watching the progress of your videos, definitely showcased how well you've improved throughout your audio and throughout your editing. And I think um, it's all become a lot clearer and just neater and just very, like the pleasure of actually watching the video has definitely increased. Mm -hmm. um, I am I am thinking that you will definitely improve in the future as well, that this is a good step forward, a step towards the right direction. Um, yeah, overall, I would give it a definitely seven out of 10. <laughs> From the scripting to the voice acting, I think the whole thing has come very far, which you should be very proud of. I do think it is something that you should be more proud of than you are. Um, <laughs> I'd give the video a six, I'm not gonna lie. I'm like, <laughs> he's five. wrong. 5.5 <laughs> or six, maybe if I'm being generous, but. Mm. We'll, we'll, we'll wait for the other sh we'll wait for the other stuff we'll wait for your future videos and then we'll come back then to we'll this one back. day right we're um, done that's all i got you can stop sweating your underarm i boots. am sweater <laughs> i can feel the sweat as well that's funny